It's really important, I think, for us to keep in mind that the, you know, sort of um, shiny generative AI thing that's captured everybody's imagination is only a very, very small and perhaps not even that important piece of um, the very um, extensive toolbox of things that we kind of refer to as AI and machine learning broadly. You know, we also need to be mindful that um, we're increasingly going to see uh, a lot of those technologies combined with other technologies, notably, um, you know, robotics, remote sensing, things of that nature in um, a sort of unusual hybrid ways. One of the things I've spent a lot of time on over the past year is looking at how AI is affecting the practice of science. If you look at what's going on with scientific practice, generative AI of the sort that has captured the public imagination um, doesn't look like it's going to play a very big role. Um, uh, the really big ones look like they're more machine learning driven. Um, and, uh, you know, they deal with things like predicting the properties of materials, um, predicting how um, uh, proteins will fold or how they will bind with other molecules, uh, these, these kinds of things. And these are having a really, you know, genuine impact in some areas now. There are some very interesting shortcuts showing up between traditional computational science-based approaches and machine learning approaches. So to just give you one example of that, um, you know, one of the sort of flagship problems that has driven the um, development of uh, high-performance computing over the last 50 years has been weather prediction. And weather prediction, if you look at how they traditionally do it, is very much physics based. You know, you, 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 you set up a three dimensional grid essentially and simulate physics phenomena in there. And the issue is, um, how finely, uh, how fine a grid can you simulate? Um, you know, how much resolution can you go to essentially? And then can you do the predictions quickly enough so that um, they're actually useful? So they've built some machine learning based systems, which really, you know, they're not sort of classic supercomputer sized uh, applications. These will run on a good laptop and they give pretty darn good weather predictions, just about as good as the physics-based models. So now you're um, starting to see people thinking about how can we use this in tandem with the physics-based predictions? Uh, fascinating kinds of phenomena. Um, so I, I think thinking about how these things can really change um, the practice of science over the next decade or two are really, really exciting. Um, we're also seeing these fascinating um, sort of closed loop things with robotics. So um, you, you think about something like predicting the properties of new materials and the results seem pretty good, but they're not perfect. And um, what, what we can think about those predictions um, uh, as doing is providing sort of signposts for fruitful experimentation. So you can start thinking about setting up systems of experimental labs. Maybe they're automated, maybe they're not. Um, uh, maybe there's something in between um, that go and test out these predicted properties, see if you really can synthesize the material and it really behaves as predicted, and then cycle back and make the next round of predictors that much better because we have better training data. You really are genuinely, I think, starting to see some changes in, um, in the practice of scholarship out of this. 
you know, when we take a five year view or a 10 year view, um, these things will find their place in teaching and learning and research. Um, uh, they'll adapt, you know, the, the immediate response when we saw, for example, these chatbots was pretty disgraceful in some circles. It was basically, you know, how can we improve our plagiarism detectors to stop people from using this rather than thinking about how can we really use this in a constructive way to improve um, educational processes, which frankly, if they're that vulnerable to, um, you know, uh, a fairly low level generative AI application have something very wrong with them to begin with. Um, you know, I, and I think, I think if we look at a five year period, you know, that will get sorted out. Academia frequently has these patchwork you know, stupid reactions to things. I mean, I'm thinking of when um, Wikipedia, for example, surfaced into uh, the consciousness of many people who were teaching introductory courses. Um, and, you know, people were absolutely forbidden from using this instrument of the devil. Um, uh, you know, and now it's just kind of assimilated in and it's another tool. I think that we need to be careful about extrapolating some of the very short term stuff. So, for example, we are, uh, you know, if you look at the um, the chatbots du jour, they are being driven off of these large language models. And it seems like there is a um, testosterone laden um, you know, competition for who can waste the most um, cycles uh, building the biggest model with the largest number of parameters and trained on the, um, you know, biggest amount of stuff. But um, it's not really clear how those curves extrapolate out. There's, you know, there's some evidence that there's a lot of leveling off starting to happen that, you know, bigger is not, after a certain point, bigger doesn't get you too far. The conversation as people are getting smarter about these models is becoming much more nuanced. It's, um, you know, to the point of, um, well, if I can make a model that I can run on a high-end phone, as opposed to a massively expensive, um, you know, uh, computational resource. And it's, you know, 90, 95% is good. Um, is that good enough for most of the applications we want from it? Is, is that gonna work for, you know, quick and dirty translation? Is the extra 5% worth it? I think that there are some, you know, more visionary kinds of goals, some of which have been around for a really long time now, like um, building intelligent agents. Um, intelligent assistance. That's really hard. That was hard 30 years ago um, when it was first being promoted. Um, it's hard now. And, you know, if you look at the mess, for example, that generative AI is making as Google has attempted to put it into search, um, where it gives you, uh, you know, all of these terrible summaries, everybody hates them. Um, you know, uh, I, I certainly don't want to delegate something like this to, you know, go around doing my banking or booking my travel or, you know, anything else like that. And I don't, I don't really think I could be wrong, but I, I don't think that the pathway to that is going to be just training models with more parameters. I think that the way, you know, the way forward is going to be some new technologies and some new techniques. Let, let me just spin a possible feature here for you. And um, don't take this as a prediction, um, but rather as, you know, something that conceivably could happen that maybe gives you an insight into some of the forces at play. So one thing that's happening right now, at least in U.S. universities, is that staffing for research has become massively more expensive. The move towards giving um, postdocs a living wage 
graduate students, a living wage, the unionization of graduate students has all basically meant that um, people budgets for research grants have gone up a lot. Um, the research grants themselves are not getting any bigger. So that means you're going to have less grants or less people. So now can we delegate some of what some of those people are doing to um, various kinds of machine learning and AI and robotics kinds of things? Now, I think we probably can. And I actually think that maybe that's a good thing. Higher ed has a history of being very abusive to its graduate students in the sense that it treats them as cheap labor and doesn't necessarily have them do things that are particularly sensible or even useful to their education. Think of the history of using graduate students as laboratory system administrators for 20, 30 years. Um, just because it was cheap and you could make them do it. Um, I think a lot of the bench technician work is actually being done in a lot of our labs by rather overqualified people right now, just because historically that labor has been cheap. So now let's let's go on from here and say, okay, so maybe we can automate some of these people or some of these roles. Um, how does this play out? What would it be like if we could basically generate as many bench chemists as we needed? How does that change the role of principal investigators, which now, I mean, Dan Cohen, for example, has speculated, maybe they become sort of, you know, visionary leaders of these, you know, armies of um, both, you know, computational and human um, uh, scientists in a very different way. Um, how, how constrained are our various scientific disciplines by the numbers of um, bench scientists or you know, scientists more broadly that we have in them. I don't think anybody understands that terrifically well. Uh, it seems to me quite plausible that as we get into this over the next decade or two, we may find that some um, disciplines or subdisciplines or <clears throat> um, sort of research practices are very amenable to this multiplier effect. Um, it looks, for example, like some, for, some areas of material science, as we were discussing, are really good like this. Um, probably some areas of molecular biology are good like this. Um, I am much less clear, very much less clear, that um, much of physics is going to be like this. Um, particularly theoretical physics or astrophysics. Um, I just, I, I'm, I don't necessarily see how until you get to the point where um, uh, computational things can formulate hypotheses and then prove or disprove them, um, uh, we really get that multiplier effect in those areas. And um, right now, <clears throat> I think we're a very long way away from knowing how to do that computationally, although there are people working on it. That leads me to believe <clears throat> that, you know, mathematics, um, theoretical mathematics outside of a few niche sub areas um, uh, may be quite um, quite resistant to this kind of multiplier effect. On the other hand, there is a lot of evidence starting to emerge that <clears throat> we'll see other kinds of mathematical practices um, get revised. Uh, there's been a lot of progress in um, basically the formalization of 
theorems and their proofs. And so you now are seeing, um, you know, you've always had this problem in leading edge mathematics that someone will prove something with a long and difficult proof. And it can take years, literally, for that proof to get socialized into the mathematical community, both through peer review um, of the formal sort around an article, but also the less formal peer review of just other respected peers in the field um, before they really have confidence that that proof is right. Um, there are some proofs, some bodies of work that are so complicated that, <clears throat> you know, it, it, they never get there or it literally takes 10 years or um, the techniques are largely lost. Um, uh, so they're fascinating stories around these kinds of things and you know, how confidence is built in them. Now they are getting to the point where they can formalize some of these proofs. And they actually did this recently with a very complicated piece of you know, leading edge research mathematics and then run them through these theorem provers to basic, basically as a way of verifying that the mathematician got the proof right and didn't miss any major steps. Um, uh, so it's not, it's not that they can prove, you know, the theorem from scratch, but rather that given some guidance in the general layout of the proof, you get a, you get a, a formalized verification that can give you a much higher degree of confidence in the correctness of the proof. I think that when they start using um, AI techniques on their students, um, uh, for whatever reasons, you know, success prediction, identifying people who are having difficulties, uh, placement, you know, I, there are a million reasons why they might want to do this. Um, I'm not, sh I'm not actually all that convinced that AI itself adds a lot of new concerns. Um, many of the fundamental concerns are about consent, transparency, um, uh, you know, ethical treatment of people. Um, uh, AI gives you some tools to um, be even more horrible than you could with the lat with the preceding set of tools. But the 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 fundamental problems. Um, to me feel like they're largely conserved. Um, I think we need to be careful about importing tools that um, have been trained on data that we don't understand or, uh, you know, and that because of that, they may have, um, they, they may have bias. I, Bias is a very popular word that I'm not crazy about. Um, they, they, they may, you know, have been taught to recognize patterns that are not applicable to, um, you know, to the to the um, target population that our institutions may be using them on, um, uh, which I think is often a better way to say it. I mean, bias often, at least the way I hear it used, implies some sort of you know, deliberate, um, uh, malign intent. Um, uh, and I think, you know, attributing malign intent to, uh, um, machine learning algorithms is just stupid. So that's a piece of it. I think that, um, you know, when we talk about applications to research in the broader world, there is a great challenge getting our students to, think about what they're doing and use these technologies in appropriate ways. Um, uh, you know, for example, um, uh, we train a lot of um, people who go into the law, who become judges and attorneys and things like that. Now, we don't actually 
exercise a lot of legal system ourselves in the universities. Um, but we, we train people to go out and be part of the broader legal system. I think that some of the ways that I have seen, um, you know, machine learning and uh, predictive systems deployed in the, you know, judicial um, and criminal justice system just make my head explode. Um, and, uh, um, you know, certainly I would hope that we are having a conversation with um, uh, people who will go out and be part of that system uh, about understanding, um, you know, what makes sense and what doesn't in there. I mean, it's it almost goes beyond ethics to just not being stupid. You know, when we're doing engineering, you know, um, for example, I think that um, you got to get people to think hard about, um, uh, you know, autonomous systems of various kinds and how autonomous they are. And, you know, I mean, the whole experience with um, self-driving vehicles is very interesting there. Um, and one that's been, I think, you know, oversimplified a bit from a ethical point of view. Um, uh, and there are a million niche applications for autonomous vehicles, um, you know, just because you don't want them necessarily on crowded uh, city streets um, in between the school buses. Um, doesn't necessarily mean they're not a good idea when you're trying to do logistic support on a battlefield. Mm -hmm.